car rentals, concert tickets, cable charges, credit cards, they have all got one thing in common, extra fees that get tacked on in the purchasing process. President Biden and his administration are calling them junk fees, and getting rid of them has become a big part of his economic agenda. It'll be featured in his State of the Union address. NPR White House correspondent Deepa Shivaram has more. If you want to sit next to your child on a flight, it might cost an extra $50. Late on your credit card payment, that's $32. A processing fee for those concert tickets you want to buy, another $15. These fees really add up now. They you know, exist across so many things that we buy. That's Neil Mahoney, an economist from Stanford University. He worked with the White House on tackling junk fees. They cost people money. They're also annoying. They sort of you know, they're an, uh, another sign, I think, to people that, you know, sort of the deck is, is stacked against them. Mahoney says that early on, President Biden directed his team to lean in on this issue, so much so that the president brought it up in his State of the Union address last year. Junk fees may not matter to the very wealthy, but they matter to most other folks in homes like the one I grew up in, like many of you did. They add up to hundreds of dollars a month. Since then, the White House has been pushing on this issue. Last June, after a fiasco thousands of people faced as they tried to buy Taylor Swift tickets, the president hosted the leaders of major companies like Live Nation to get them to be more transparent about their fees. This week, the administration announced a new rule to cap credit card late fees at just $8. Lindsay Owens runs Groundwork Collaborative, a left-leaning think tank in Washington. She says it's important for Biden to call out these companies. She named Ticketmaster and the Biden administration blocking a merger between Spirit Airlines and JetBlue as part of this. I think when he picks these visible fights, Americans do pay attention. Um, They do understand what the stakes are, and they do see President Biden fighting for them. Whether people are paying attention is going to be critical for Biden in the lead up to November. The economy remains a top issue for voters in the election, and those surveys show that people feel better about how the economy is doing compared to a few months ago. They're not giving Biden credit for that. In fact, polls show that voters favor Biden's likely opponent, former President Donald Trump, on the economy instead. But with something like junk fees, Owen says it's an issue that more people can connect with compared to broader economic conversations like ones about inflation and employment numbers. These pocketbook consumer issues, you know, like junk fees, I think are are highly visible to Americans because, look, everywhere they turn, you know, they're being overcharged. Polling shows that eliminating and lowering junk fees is popular across the board with both Democrats and Republicans. And the Biden campaign and the White House know that. Here's Mahoney. We joke, but but with some seriousness that, you know, we have polls almost as well as baseball and, and apple pie. For his State of the Union address, the most widely watched speech the president gives every year, he'll mention junk fees again, though what exactly the president will say is unclear. But an administration official tells NPR that the topic is a way for the president to tell a wider story about competition. The president wants there to be a level playing field for businesses. And for consumers, he wants the cost of things to be up front. Deepa Shivaram, NPR News. President Biden delivers his State of the Union address tonight. The speech is a chance for the president to try to put to rest some of the lingering questions from voters about his age. Here's NPR senior White House correspondent Tamara Keith. This is a high stakes moment for President Biden, but the stakes were actually quite similar last year. He hadn't yet made his campaign for re-election official, and there were doubts even within his own party about whether he was really up for it. His answer came 32 minutes into the speech. Some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's the majority. Somewhere in the cacophony, Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was shouting liar and you lie. And the president saw an opportunity to go off script. Well, I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. And he kept improvising, you know, seemingly negotiating in real time with a rowdy chamber. So, folks... As we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be stopped. All right. We got unanimity. It was a reaffirming moment that the president still got it. 
Faz Shakir managed Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign. He says it was reassuring to see a president who is often overly scripted do something spontaneous. He's got his wits, he's got his humor, he's got his fight. He says it also worked because Biden was standing up for popular programs and taking the fight directly to his Republican antagonists in Congress. After that speech, the Democratic establishment quickly fell in line. And it became a story Biden loved to recount. During the State of the Union, as some of you may have seen, I was... But concerns about Biden's age didn't stay quiet for long. Then last month, special counsel Robert Hur came out with a report about the handling of classified documents that described Biden as a, quote, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. And as part of an effort to push back, Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre cited that moment in the chamber. I mean, we saw it at the last State of the Union. He, you know, he was able to negotiate while giving a very important speech about 90 minutes. You can only eat so many lunches on that, I think. Carolyn Curiel was a speechwriter for former President Bill Clinton. So much of the discourse in recent weeks has been about Biden's age, his stamina, the occasional mix-up of a foreign leader's name. She says coming into it, many people's expectations for his performance are quite low. My take? Biden has his critics right where he needs them. He's always been underestimated. The White House says President Biden will lay out what he's done for the American people so far and his vision for the future. He'll talk about election year flashpoints like abortion rights and the border and again plead with Congress to support aid for Ukraine. The timing of this speech means it's happening as the 2024 general election begins in earnest. Former President Donald Trump is now the presumptive Republican nominee for president. Karen Finney is a Democratic political consultant. Really, now we're at the start of 2024, and it's the opportunity for President Biden to really lay out, here's what this election is about, here's what my presidency has been about, what's at stake, what I'm fighting for. Fight is a word that keeps coming up as people describe Biden's task tonight. And a lot of that has to do with his performance. This is sacrilegious for a speechwriter to say, but it's actually not in the words that he says, but in the way he presents those words. Sarah DePerry was a speechwriter for former President Barack Obama. It is one thing to sort of say, I am the person who is fighting for you. But if you appear as though you don't have a lot of fight in you, that's not particularly compelling to people who want that. And so I think what he did so well last year was just come out swinging. But repeat performances of improvised moments can be very hard to replicate. Tamara Keith, NPR News. The political future of many Democrats on Capitol Hill is intertwined with President Biden's. That's especially true for lawmakers facing competitive races this fall. NPR congressional correspondent Deirdre Walsh talked to Swings District Democrats about what they want to hear in tonight's State of the Union speech. Dina Titus wants Biden to tout specific things he got done. Don't talk about infrastructure, talk about the street in my district. She represents a purple Nevada seat and wants the president to remind people that the economy is doing better because of his policies. Las Vegas is the fastest recovering place in the country, and we were the hardest hit. So we need to remind people we're working now. You've got health care. Things are moving. We're getting the speed train to Southern California. Democrats say the primetime speech, when millions will be tuning in, is a good time for the president to remind voters what he's done and lay out what he plans to do with four more years. Last year, Biden energized Democrats by getting into a back and forth with Republicans about protecting Social Security. Pennsylvania Democrat Matt Cartwright represents Scranton, Pennsylvania, where Biden grew up, and he hopes he'll go off script again. Uh, He needs to get his Irish up the way he did last year. He says the economy is improving, which is why he thinks voters tell him the border is now their top concern. They're starting to realize the economy isn't as bad as it used to be. So there's a, there's a new villain to talk about. Freshman Gabe Vasquez represents a district in southern New Mexico. 
He wants Biden to call out Republicans for blocking bipartisan proposals to address the U.S.-Mexico border. The president needs to take a stronger and a, a much stronger leadership role in this conversation nationally. He also wants Biden to address those who aren't feeling a growing economy. Folks in my district, and the number one issue I hear about is that their paychecks aren't big enough, that they're one medical emergency away from bankruptcy, and that with the cost of groceries, utilities, and everything else going up, they're looking for some relief. Vasquez was the first swing district Democrat to call for a ceasefire in the war in the Mideast and wants Biden to take a stronger stand. And I think the president should also find it in his heart the right thing to do is to make sure that no more civilian bloodshed is incurred at the expense of American taxpayer dollars. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen served in the House and ran the Democrats' campaign committee during the 2008 presidential campaign. He says the State of the Union needs to remind people what Biden's done, but also set up the contrast with his likely opponent, former President Trump. Talk to the country about the progress that we have made, but also progress still to be made, and the dangers of turning back the clock to a poisonous, divisive, chaotic administration of the former president. Democrats say voter concerns about Biden being too old for another term are out there. But Titus says it's about the experience, not the age. Just acknowledge it and move on. No point in trying to hide it. Everybody knows his birthday. Tom Swazi, who just won a special election in New York, says Biden can't change his age. But how he comes across will help the president. I think that people are looking to see, oh, how's this guy going to do in his performance? And I believe he's going to exceed expectations. Biden's performance and his message could help him and these swing district Democrats get reelected in 2024. Deirdre Walsh, NPR News, the Capitol. There's a lot riding on President Biden in tonight's State of the Union address. Aides say the president is going to show he's in command, feisty, and not too old for another term. And they say he'll confront the issues he struggled with, including the war in Gaza and immigration. Deepa Shivaram is an NPR White House correspondent, and she joins us now. Hi, Deepa. Hey there. So all State of the Union speeches, of course, are important, but perhaps this one is more so than others that Biden has given. What does the White House hope he'll accomplish tonight? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a fair point. This is a State of the Union in an election year, right, where we already know it's going to be a really tight race. And this address tonight is a chance for Biden to elevate what a second term for him would look like. The State of the Union is typically the most watched speech the president gives all year. Year. So with a wider audience, he's going to be trying to highlight what he thinks his major accomplishments are and lay out what he still wants to do. But for Biden's team, you know, this election has always been about drawing stark contrast between him and his likely opponent, who's former President Donald Trump. And we don't know if he's going to be naming Trump directly, but I think you'll definitely see the president try to offer up those differences in what he's trying to accomplish versus what the other side is doing, especially when it comes to things like abortion and reproductive rights. There's a few gaps of the first lady tonight who will be in the chamber, including a woman from Texas who had to leave the state to get an emergency abortion. And with this recent ruling in Alabama on IVF, there's also a guest who's a woman from there who had to pause her IVF treatments abruptly after that court ruling. So one of the things that Biden is going to be under the spotlight for, at least in the beginning of the speech, is um, uh, the fact that many Americans say that his age is an issue for them and that he may have lost his spark. But we should say during last year's speech, the president did something that impressed a lot of observers. Let's listen now. Here he is going off script when Republicans heckled him when he claimed the GOP wanted to cut Social Security and Medicare. Anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. So we should say um, that House Speaker Mike Johnson is asking his party to behave themselves and keep <laughs> yeah. decorum. We could hear the lack of decorum from uh, the last State of the Union speech in the background. Is the White House expecting similar heckling tonight? I mean, this has come up in the White House briefings recently, you know, questions of how interactive does the president expect the speech to be tonight? You know, obviously that moment last year wasn't exactly exactly 
planned, right? But it it did kind of speak to Biden's ability standing at that podium, you know, as a, as a negotiator. Biden spent years in the Senate and is known for negotiating across the aisle, getting deals done. And even during that back and forth, all that chaos, he turned that interruption and, and all of that booing from Republicans into somewhat of a moment of strength for him, you know, trying to keep them in check and, and get them in line when they're talking about uh, Medicare and Social Security. So this age question that keeps popping up for Biden, you know, the counterpoint that the Biden team will often make is, you know, look what he gets done. Look at all the things he can accomplish with his experience. Um, but as you point out, you know, there has been uh, some reporting saying that Mike Johnson has has told Republican lawmakers to maintain decorum tonight. Uh, so it's unclear how much of that uh, element will be there in, in the speech. OK, two other issues very briefly. On the economy, um, economic indicators are up. That should work to Biden's favor, but the message has not seemed to connect with voters. How's he going to deal with that? Yeah, that is definitely true. There's polling that shows that voters are feeling better about the economy, but they're not exactly giving the president credit for that. And the White House has been consistently saying for a while now that this is just something that's going to take time. Uh, But in the speech tonight, I think Biden will really focus on this aspect of lowering costs for Americans. Uh, One of the things that you can expect him to talk about is uh, his effort on reducing what they call junk fees, uh, which is things like extra credit card fees, resort fees. And that's something that is really politically popular. Okay. And briefly, uh, he's under a lot of pressure to come up with a solution on immigration at the border. What's he likely to say there? Yeah, there's been a lot of ping-ponging on this issue, right? But I think on this topic of the border, you're going to hear the president put this issue squarely on Congress and Republicans in Congress. You know, there was a deal. Everyone had agreed to it, and they backed out. And that's the rhetoric rhetoric you've been hearing from the president for a while now. I will say it is a little different from how Biden had been talking about the border in the past. He used to very much be on defense on this issue. Now he's really going on the offense here. Um, There was some talk about executive actions that he might take on the border, but it doesn't sound like that is going to come up tonight. Deepa Shivaram is White House correspondent for NPR. Thanks a lot, Deepa. Thank you. President Biden has a lot to talk about tonight in the State of the Union address, from immigration to the economy to the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. As Biden lays out his policy priorities, he'll also be working to convince those who question his physical and mental capability that he can and should serve another term as president. And that means how he delivers tonight's speech will be important. Carol Kinsey Goman is an executive coach who helps corporate leaders speak more effectively. Carol, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Lisa. President Biden is known as a pretty limber speaker. Um, He can deliver a speech in a way that seems to make an audience feel connected. That's been the case throughout his political career. So giving major speeches is something that he seems pretty comfortable with. Tonight, though, the stakes are especially high. Number one, he's facing re-election and he's facing criticism about his age and capabilities. I don't want you to give political advice, but more along the line of advice you would give to the leader of a company who is facing criticism. What what would you tell the president? In this case, President Biden has two mental biases working against him. He's got confirmation bias. So for those of us who already prefer Trump and are biased against Biden, All we'll be looking for are ways to confirm our opinion. And then there's threat alert bias. Our brains are always on alert for signs of threat. For those of us in the audience who support the president, but have been alerted to fear that he doesn't have the youth or stamina needed, we're also going to be hyper aware of any sign that this is true. That's true for any leader. Knowing how the audience already perceives you how they have been primed to perceive you is really key in knowing how to present yourself. And to get granular for a second, the president has long had a speech impediment, a stutter, that he has managed well but can show up in his, especially I think when he is tired. And I wonder how that plays into the pressure on him tonight and an audience's perception of him. So when Biden has stuttered as a child. He still hesitates sometimes. He stumbles sometimes. And he doesn't necessarily do well improvising. So those are things that he brings to the table that he needs to be aware of. Luckily, the first few minutes can say a lot about a speaker's presence 
and it has nothing to do with what they're saying. So those first few minutes entering the room and shaking hands and walking up to the stage and the podium, those are all things that are maybe more important than he knows or that any speaker knows. In fact, when you're meeting someone for the first time, you've got about seven seconds to make an impression. <laughs> but and no that pressure. has everything to do right. with your body language. I, that's, it, it's kind of amazing, um, but I think that's human nature. So so beyond the seven seconds, what, what can the president do? I mean, what if you had his ear? Would you tell him about the seven seconds and especially beyond that? He's very good at projecting warmth and comfort. But he needs to hang on to that. Staying poised under pressure, staying composed, keeping your composure in stressful situations so that you appear reliable, capable, and in control, which is a direct opposite of what your opponent may be projecting. So I would say no wild gestures, particularly above the shoulders, no contemptuous looks or grimaces, if you're threatened or somebody asks or somebody does something rude in the audience, which has happened before. And which may happen again because I think there could conceivably be efforts to throw the president off his game. Absolutely. And I think that staying on his game, pausing, breathing before responding, simply showing people that he has that poise under pressure will go a long way. And how about the linguistics part of it? Because President Biden's campaign has been criticized for not conveying his major accomplishments from uh, the stock market being up, the economy being up, uh, inflation being down. How do you get a leader to speak convincingly about what they should be prizing and get an audience to listen where they may not have listened before? What he needs to do, what any leader needs to do, is absolutely own that. You need to believe what you're talking about. Because when you do, your body language aligns perfectly with your verbal message. So the most important thing when you get a speech is to rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it. And then when you get on stage, forget about yourself. Focus on the value of your message to your audience. Own that. Believe that. Because in the end, it's all about them. Carol Kinsey-Goman, author, speaker, and executive coach. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Lisa, it's been my privilege and pleasure. Thank you. One year ago, President Biden came to Congress for his State of the Union address. In keeping with tradition, his host, the Speaker of the House, introduced him. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor to present to you the President of the United States. Tonight, the President returns for another introduction, likely in the exact same words, though Speaker Kevin McCarthy is no longer around to speak them. Republican colleagues unseated McCarthy after he worked with President Biden. Tonight, Biden will ask the new speaker to work with him because several of his priorities are stuck in Congress, which we discussed with Biden's chief of staff, Jeff Zients. Do you assume that you will get no meaningful agreement on any big issue out of Congress before the election because of the politics? No, that is not our assumption. Um, It's going to be difficult, but there are three pieces of business, uh, and you'll hear the president talk about this in the State of the Union, that Congress has to act on. Zients is a veteran of government and business. He works in a corner office near Biden's and took our call yesterday between sessions of helping to prepare the president's address. Biden wants Congress to pass its budget rather than constantly putting it off. That is no way to run a government. He wants Congress to approve more aid for Ukraine against Russia. This is a no-brainer. And then there's a tangled issue that's been trouble for every recent president. What's the third item? The third piece is the border. Which is an issue of both substance and politics. Thousands of asylum seekers have crossed into the United States. Earlier this year, senators worked out a bipartisan plan to change asylum rules and add personnel. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump told his party to block it, leaving the president still facing the problem. We need Congress to provide resources to manage the border. We just don't have enough border patrol agents, enough asylum officers. We also, at the same time, need policy reforms. And, you know, I think what we're seeing is some some Republicans want 
chaos at the border rather than order. And we need to get the resources and the policy changes necessary to secure the border. Well, given that Republicans have stopped action on that for the moment, Speaker Johnson said the president can close the border on his own. And I told him that again today in person, as I've said to him many times, publicly and privately over the last several weeks. It's time for action. He's even claimed that he read the law to the president that gives him authority to close the border on his own. Why can't the president do that? Look, the president has um, done many executive actions at the border. There's no executive action that replaces the need for the resources. And also the changes in law to asylum and an emergency order to close down the border, that needs legislation. And, you know, the president uh, has led in a bipartisan way historic legislation across the first three years in office, arguably more legislation in the first three years than most presidents get done in two terms. And it's how we're going to secure the border. I want to be clear on what you're talking about there for people who don't follow this every day. You alluded to asylum seekers. There are many, many thousands of people who show up claiming asylum. Uh, The United States has been paroling a lot of them into the United States to wait for years until their hearings. Are you saying there is no law that the president could call upon to limit that flow to turn more of them away? First of all, we need the resources to manage the people who show up at the border. We don't have enough asylum officers who are the people determine whether people you know, have a right to be in the country. So we'll do what we can do, uh, but short of getting the resources, uh, we do not have the ability to manage the border in an orderly way. Congress needs to act. Which was a theme of our talk with Jeff Zients, though on other issues, his boss is the one who faces pressure to act. Is there some new way that the president can answer critics within his own party on his support for Israel and Israel's conduct in this war against Hamas? Look, I think you'll hear the president speak to Israel and to the situation in the Middle East, and he'll make clear that, as he has, that Israel has a right to protect its people and to degrade Hamas. Um, The president will spend a good deal of time talking about the massive toll on innocent civilians in Gaza. Biden has gradually grown louder in criticizing an Israeli offensive that has killed thousands of women and children. But negotiators have yet to reach a ceasefire, much less a more lasting peace. And he will talk about his work day and night uh, and his team's work to negotiate an immediate ceasefire for at least six weeks secure the release of the hostages, get more humanitarian aid in, and, you know, hopefully be on a path to a possible end to fighting. And he'll talk about, as he has uh, the last several months and the last many years, about enduring peace in the region and the need for a two-state solution, peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, including Saudi Arabia. So this will be an area of real emphasis in the State of the Union. Useful to know. Can you reach that settlement with the current Prime Minister of Israel? Look, I think that um, the president's going to continue to work with Arab nations and with the state of Israel and the prime minister of Israel to get a temporary ceasefire and get the hostages home and get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. I want to ask a little more broadly about the president's agenda. I had an opportunity before talking with you. I talked to a lot of people, but I was talking with Faz Shakir who's an advisor to Bernie Sanders, a little more on the left side mm-hmm. of the Democratic Party. Yes, he gives a good the, man. He, he gives the president credit for, as he sees it, pushing back on corporate power, many antitrust moves, for example. But Shakir thinks the president has not highlighted that, has not outlined a broad theme of pushing back against corporations because the politics he thinks may not work for him. Is there any truth to that? Well, I'd have you tune in uh, to the State of the Union. You'll hear the president talk about lowering costs. Uh, You know, inflation is down by two thirds, but prices are still too high in many areas. You know, last year in the State of the Union, you might recall uh, the president talked about junk fees and how a parent would have to pay extra to sit next to their young child on a plane. Thanks to the president's leadership, that's no longer the case. Uh, Parents don't have to pay extra. He'll highlight other junk fees, excessive charges on credit cards or for overdraft fees. And that'll be a continued emphasis going forward. If the president should win a second term, what's a big thing on his agenda? Well, there's a lot of big things on his agenda. Uh, We talked about lowering costs, continuing to make people's lives better by investing in child care, elder care, paid family and medical leave continued progress on student debt. But I think, importantly, the president's also going to call for restoring Roe versus Wade uh, and giving women freedom over their health care. And he'll talk about 
protecting, not taking away freedoms in other areas, as well as uh, voting rights. Restoring Roe versus Wade would be an objective for a second term with a different Congress, presumably, you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jeff Zients, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. He's the White House Chief of Staff. This is live special coverage from NPR News. We're here to watch and listen to President Biden's State of the Union speech. He is at the United States Capitol this evening, along with almost all the members of Congress and the Supreme Court and the Cabinet. Almost all. It's a civic ritual. We are nearby in NPR Studio 42, and you can listen on your radio station or watch at NPR.org or NPR's YouTube channel. I'm Steve Inskeep in the studio here with NPR's Mara Liason and Asma Khalid. Mara is NPR's national political correspondent. Asma covers the White House for NPR News and for ABC News, we should note. And I just want people to know, for those who are watching, we always dress up like this when we're on the radio, (laughs) no matter what time of day, whatever it is. Mara, what is the ritual here that we're about to watch? In fact, that in a way has sort of begun because the House chamber is, is full down the street. Yeah, for those watching on our channel you can see that members of Congress are filling the House floor, and you can see a lot of women wearing white. Mm -hmm. And those are female members of Congress. I'm assuming they're all Democrats, and they're wearing white, which was the color of the suffragettes. Hmm. And on occasion, there have been groups of elected female officials who wear white to either show their support for Hillary Clinton or Roe versus Wade. And in this case, I think it's for reproductive rights. I I really appreciate you raising that because this is a night of symbolism. We're going to hear lots and lots and lots of words from the president, as is always the case. But the fact of them coming together means something. The fact of what they do on that floor means something. The expressions, the gestures, the applause, the lack of applause, everything. Especially in an election year. This is the biggest set piece that a president has. It's going to be the biggest audience that he has, certainly until he gives his convention speech in the summer. You said this was a civic ritual. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a civil ritual (laughs) because we have, it's not as bad as the British Parliament, but but people do yell and scream at the president. And sometimes, as in last year's State of the Union address, he takes very good advantage of that. Uh, He is somebody who can improvise and be spontaneous, um, despite, you know, the caricature of him in conservative media that he is doddering and senile and can't put one word after another. But he did very well last year in terms of riffing off the audience. Riffing off the audience, yeah. riffing off the hecklers, taking yes. the opportunity, Asma Khalid, to show that he was with it in that moment. That's right. And that is something that I think a lot of folks will be watching, frankly, not just the analysts and the politicians, but a lot of voters. We've seen in poll after poll that a number of voters, including Democratic voters, do have concerns about the president's age. And I think this is a prime time, huge moment where he can alleviate some of those concerns and really put them to rest. I'm thinking about a quote from David Axelrod, former advisor to former President Obama, who has spoken out about the president's age a long time, uh, for, for quite some time. And in a recent article, I believe it was Axelrod who said that without the disadvantage of his age, the perceived disadvantage of his age, the president would walk away with this election. There'd be no question about it. That was one argument or one way to look at it. It's a disadvantage the president wants to, to deal with in some way. That's true, though I do think there are some policy concerns that the president really does need to put to rest, and we'll hear some of those things tonight. I mean, Mm -hmm. this is really, I think, the first opportunity where Biden will have a chance to present a clear contrast with uh, the man who he is likely facing again, Donald Trump, uh, the man who he defeated in the 2020 election. Thus far, we've heard in previous State of the Unions, Biden kind of make the case for what he's accomplished. I think tonight you'll certainly hear them talk about improvements in the economy, but you will also talk about what still needs to be done. There's a focus we've been told about cutting costs, trying to create a fair tax system, some improvements around making, uh, you know, child care, housing more affordable. It's a chance for him to articulate what a second term agenda would look like. But also, I would say there's other issues, immigration, foreign policy, the war in the Middle East that he needs to uh, to address to some degree to alleviate voters. I'm really glad you mentioned immigration because we heard on NPR's Morning Edition this morning from Jeff Zients, the president's chief of staff, who said that we can expect to hear a lot specifically about immigration. And in this case, what the president 
president is going to do is challenge Congress to do something, because there was a compromise measure that would have given more resources and changed some of the asylum laws to deal with thousands of asylum seekers coming across the border. That did not get through Congress. The president can challenge Congress, which means, Mara Eliason, that he has an opportunity to try to take the offensive on an issue that has been damaging to him, according to many surveys. That's right. Immigration is the worst issue for Democrats, kind of the mirror image of abortion, which is the worst issue for Republicans. Um, yes, I think he'll do that. He has tried to call the Republicans bluff. He agreed to an extremely conservative uh, immigration bill. And uh, he, Donald Trump decided that he would rather have the issue. And he told Republicans, don't bring this bill up on the floor. Um, and Republicans agreed. I think the other way that the president will use the House Republicans as a foil is when it comes to national security. And mm -hmm. he's going to talk about that bill that would have given military aid to Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. It has tremendous bipartisan support in the House. It would pass by huge majorities, over 300 votes. But it doesn't have the support of a majority of Republicans in the House. Hmm. And that's why Speaker Johnson won't put it on the floor. I'm so that's minority rule right there. You mentioned Speaker Johnson. I'm thinking of another bit of symbolism, which people watching at NPR.org right. or at He's YouTube right will behind see. Him. The Speaker's right, right over his left shoulder. Right. And the impression we get is that some of the strongest jabs of this speech are likely to be at that guy who's right behind him on camera, who, if he's like past speakers, needs to watch him passively and pretend that <laughs> nothing particularly is happening in front of him, right? Maybe. Remember, Nancy Pelosi <laughs> waited till the end. <laughs> but then she ripped up the speech when Donald Trump oh, gave it. Oh, that's right. So they so, too so can yes, take they, some they can. symbolic moves. And, and, you know, Joe Biden is somebody who has part of his persona is that he's a genial Irish guy. And when he does jab someone or poke someone, it's not going to be with the cruelty of a Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're going to see him belittling somebody who's standing next to him. And he has a lot of respect for institutions. So we want to mention that members of Congress, not quite all of them, are on the floor this evening. And we would expect in the next few minutes for the president, with great formality, to be ushered into the room, to be announced and to walk into the room and to shake many hands. And, and they're going to be lining up on the aisle. That's another ritual. Try to get in the shot. <laughs> oh, try to, oh yes. I would think it was to greet the president. It, it is to greet the president <laughs> and be in the shot yeah. at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we'll look forward to that and look who gets into the shot. Yeah. And our colleague, Claudia Grisal, gets to see it in person because she is one of the people in the room. She is in the House chamber. And Claudia, I'm looking at one of these overhead camera shots that's very familiar from over the years, looking down on the hundreds of seats in the chamber of the House of Representatives. Where are you exactly? Well, I'm up in the press gallery. And yes, it's a very jovial, busy scene here. And you could say it's Congress's version of small talk. But truly, we're going to be looking at a showdown later as Biden delivers his speech and we'll see the reaction from Republicans. I understand from several Republicans I spoke to yesterday that Speaker Mike Johnson told his conference from behind closed doors that he wants to see decorum. He doesn't want to see heckling. Now, those same members I spoke to said while they agreed with that assessment, they believed it would be a very difficult moment for some of their colleagues to resist yelling out as they have in past years as President Biden has delivered his speech and their more vocal colleagues have yelled out in response. So that's going to be one moment I'm especially going to be looking forward to see if Republicans will stick to their script that Speaker Johnson has asked them to or if they'll break away as we've seen them do a number of times this past year. More than 200 lawmakers, will they all follow directions? I think we can guess how that might go, but one never knows. One e never knows. Exactly. The one Republican member told me we're going to look like British Parliament, as Mara was mentioning, if we start to break out and heckle the president again. But this is a test again. We'll see if they can meet. Um, let me get your impression to the best as best you can of how Speaker Johnson thinks he is doing so far. He has caused great frustration to the president of the United States, but he might very well argue that is his job and it's the president's problem for not not uh, getting him getting him something that he wants to wants to pass. 
Right. Speaker Johnson is very much a departure from his predecessor, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who was ousted late last year, as we know, after less than just a, several months in the job, less than a year into the job. And McCarthy was more prone to bragging about his ability as Speaker Johnson is not that way. So perhaps if it was something he would say he was doing a good job, he would say it quietly. It's more of a survey you have to do among the Republican conference. And by and large, you hear comments compliments for the speaker, even though he's had some tough votes fail on this floor in recent weeks. He's only months into the tenure, and I keep hearing from members that they appreciate his ability to work with them and try to get them the best compromise that they can. That said, the House Freedom Caucus, this is going to be the more hard right wing members of this conference don't often agree with the speaker, especially in the midst of a fight over spending and one after another deadline that threatens to shut the government down if they don't address it. Even as you speak, I'm seeing some of the more controversial members. Marjorie Taylor Greene is in red and white with a number of campaign buttons. We saw Matt Gates. We also have Supreme Court justices. And now the applause is building, which is a sign that we can expect the president of the United States shortly. The uh, first lady has just walked in. She's waving to the crowd and the chamber gallery is all facing her and applauding at this time. Big smile on her face, waving to the crowd. And uh, we can expect more luminaries to come in in the moments before the president, uh, before the president arrives. Mara Eliasson, I'm thinking um, of the fact that there are people throughout this room who have enraged each other politically at one time or another, even the Supreme Court justices. But then there's the different. Mo- here we go. Here we go. Oh, I expected, but here we are. Mr. Speaker, the President's Cabinet. And now the Cabinet members will walk in, and they'll take that walk down the line that Mar Eliasson was talking about. So right. we're they gonna won't have a lot be of as handshaking. mobbed as the President. They won't be as, as mobbed. Yeah. You know, Mar Eliasson, as I watch this, I'm reminded the first time I ever was taken into the, the House chamber, it was by our former colleague, Brian Naylor, who said one of his favorite things in the world was to stand over that, where Claudia Grisales is now, right. and just watch these people put their hands on each other's arms and, and, and hands on their backs and work each other. They're working on each other, and you can just watch that. It's, it's politics taking place. Yes, retail politics. And, uh, you know, the House has changed over the years. Obviously, there's not as much camaraderie camaraderie between Republicans and Democrats. But this is a night where they are sharing something. I wonder if there's that much camaraderie even within the parties. Like our Well, certainly not in the Republicans. They've been at each other's throats and have been quite dysfunctional, as Claudia has explained. But uh, Democrats are pretty unified. They're worried and nervous about Joe Biden, but they are unified in terms of his agenda. I am also thinking, Claudia Grisales, um, that this is a moment of transition. Uh, This, I guess, would be the final State of the Union speech in which Mitch McConnell is the Republican Senate leader. He is announcing that he's stepping down at the end of the year, although he intends to stay in the United States Senate. There is a sense of a uh, passing of the torch there uh, and, and, and of a lot of old style Republicans on their way out. Right. The president acknowledged McConnell last year, and we expect him to acknowledge him this year since he is in the final months of his legendary tenure as Republican leader in the Senate. And yes, this is a chamber that's on the verge of a lot of change. More than 50 members are serving their last terms. They are retiring from Congress, and that is in part due to all the partisan Bitter, the bitter partisanship that we're seeing play out, especially as both parties retreat further into their corners. And especially we see that with Republicans who have to deal not only with that, but a lot of infighting, at least in this chamber. I'm, I am just looking at the different cabinet members, Jennifer Granholm, Pete Buttigieg passing through. And there is Alejandro Mayorkas, who just what a couple of weeks ago was impeached by a large number of the lawmakers in this room. And now he's uh, giving an embrace to someone who's a little bit friendlier to his side. Uh, But that is part of this ritual as well. Opponents in the same room facing each other down. Yes. And also we know that the Republicans were deeply divided about that Mayorkas impeachment. So didn't quite uh, didn't quite get it the first time. Had to go for it. uh, Right. And might end up being dead on arrival in the Senate. Asma, I want to get your sense of how the people around the president feel about this moment. Publicly, at least, they project confidence. 
They are aware that in some polls, not all polls, the president is behind. There is no poll where the president is far ahead or has any comfort particularly at all. Uh, when you talk with people privately, what do you hear about this year ahead? Look, I mean, I don't think anybody feels uh, that that they can definitively say which way the election will go in November. But they do project confidence privately as well. And I think that's in part because when you look at things like the economy, they think that the trajectory is moving in the right way. You had inflation at 9 percent. Uh, what was it last time before the midterms? Now it's down to around 3 percent. They talk about the fact that consumer confidence is increasing. People are beginning to feel more positive about the economy. Now, the catch here is that while they are feeling more positive about the economy, economy, they are not yet attributing that to President Biden. Uh, They think that there's a lag and that that will come in time. But look, I think that the biggest concern you hear from Democratic allies is about the president's age. There is a recognition that that is the one factor they cannot change. And they know that that comes up in poll after poll. Um, They don't always want to say it on tape. Nobody really wants to talk about it publicly. But I I think anyone who's clear eyed within the Democratic Party realizes that that is perhaps the biggest vulnerability because it cannot be changed. Uh, Mar- and, yeah. And, you know, one thing we've seen is, you know, I always say this historical rules only work till they stop working. And one thing that we've seen is that there seems to be a broken connection between the economy and a president's approval ratings. They used to rise and fall in tandem. But look at Donald Trump. He had a very good economy and he was extremely unpopular and lost reelection. Hmm. Um, now you've got Joe Biden, who's presiding over a pretty good economy and his approval ratings are really low. So it seems like that connection is broken, which makes it hard to to predict things. Let's try to think that through. I, I think it might be difficult to analyze, but is it simply that there's been so much polarization? that I if- think that's part of it. I think that we're, we're now so, so divided, deeply divided, that Republicans would say the economy is terrible when there's a Democrat in the White House and vice versa. But it's also true that the economy hasn't come back enough for people to really feel it. People don't care about the rate of inflation. They care about prices and prices of, of, of important items like groceries, buying a house. They're still way too high. And we've had this long period of growing economic inequality and a disconnect between productivity and wage growth. That predates COVID even. But the other thing that we might be seeing is a disconnect between the president's approval rating and the ballot, the votes that he gets. In other words, Democrats keep on winning every single election since Donald Trump was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. The midterms, 2020, 2020, special elections. And um, how come, if they're so unpopular, do they keep on winning elections? And, and, and I can tell you the Democrats hope the same thing will happen to Joe Biden. We're waiting for more entries uh, into, the, into the room. And as we do that, President of the United States, there's the announcement. So we'll watch for President Biden. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. There we go. And applause at the President of the United States and others come into the room. Joe Biden shaking a few hands on the way in. As he does that, Asma Khalid, I want to mention somebody else that I saw who symbolizes a difficulty the President has. I saw Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, member of the President's Cabinet, who is there and has been continuously traveling to the Middle East and trying to make progress in the Israeli war against Gaza, which is a huge political liability for the president at home. Yeah, you know, I was on a call earlier today with some senior administration officials, and they've said that the president will certainly speak to the plight of Palestinians tonight. Uh, You have heard the president be more vocal in recent days. He plans to announce this idea of actually creating a seaport off the Gaza coast to get aid in. Uh, But to your point, they had hoped, the administration, that they would have a temporary ceasefire by Monday, the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. That looks increasingly unlikely. Claudia Grisales, what are you seeing as the president does some retail politics, talking to people face to face? Right. A lot of interesting moments as he walked in the chamber. One of the first members to greet him was Andy Ogles, a Tennessee Republican. This is the Republican who yelled, it's your fault, during Biden's State of the Union address last year. So very interesting moment. Next to him is another Tennessee Republican in an aisle seat. That's Tim Burchett. He told me he reserved his seat at 7.45 a.m. this morning by putting his jacket there and sitting there 
periodically throughout the day. This is how prime these seats are to get in the aisle and <laughs> shake the president's hand. He said last year he introduced himself and Biden responded, I know who you are, Tim. Hmm. There are other members who are quite legendary at this. Sheila Jackson Lee of Houston, Texas is in her aisle seat as usual. She has a colleague for the Houston area. This is Representative Al Green, both Democrats are there waiting to greet the president, but he is taking his time as usual to say hello to all these members. These relationships mean a lot to Biden. Right. Um, and it's a moment when you wish you could engage a lip reader. Maybe we should have had a lip reader <laughs> as part of Is our that show. Marjorie Taylor Greene in the red hat? Oh, um, I think it might be. She was wearing red and white earlier. And she's and a got bunch a of Trump hat buttons. on. Yeah, she's buttons. added a red hat. Okay, right. okay. So red and white outfit, Trump hat. Uh, also, Trump as ga- uh, Biden gave her a funny look, okay. a surprised look. And uh, you mentioned Mara Eliasson earlier. For those just joining us, there's a large number of women in white this mm-hmm. evening, which is perhaps saying a somewhat different, a different, a different message there. I want to mention that we've been told there is a designated survivor, the member of the cabinet who does not show up here in case of calamity, Miguel Cardona, the Secretary of Education. And his job is to be somewhere, possibly watching TV, possibly kicking back. We certainly don't know. Uh, There is certainly heavy security in Washington, D.C. this evening with so much of the United States government in one place. Mara, there have been times uh, when it's been an extremely tense moment for these for these speeches, when, when they're, especially after 9-11, I'm thinking, when these, these particular moments were felt fraught with danger, but people went ahead. Yes, people went ahead, and that's kind of the the story of the United States Congress. On January 6th, they went ahead. They certified the election, even though the Capitol had been breached and, and assaulted. But yes, that's that's important. It's good that you mentioned January 6th, Mara Eliasson, because Asma Khalid, it is reasonable to expect the president to make some mention of this in this particular context as he tease up an election year. Yeah, I mean, the campaign, the White House believes that democracy is at stake and that democracy is a winning issue for them heading into this re-election. And they talk a lot about wanting to frame uh, the entire conversation around freedom, freedom, whether that means voting rights or whether it means uh, reproductive rights, which is another issue that they will lean heavily into tonight, given the debate over IVF. Mara, can you talk us through that? Because there have been skeptics and critics of that democratic approach, arguing that what people want to know is what's in it for me? What's the economic program that I get? What's the scholarship forgiveness that, or rather the the student Student loan forgiveness forgiveness. that I get? Um, And the president is going for this larger theme. I think that both things are very important. What we learned in the 2018 midterms, uh, or the 2022 midterms, uh, we thought that it was all about inflation and kitchen table issues. Well, guess what? It turns out democracy was pretty important. People thought democracy was a kitchen table issue. And the same thing with abortion. We miss the importance of that in, in the midterm. So I think that both of those things are important. Uh, people feel that democratic institutions are being undermined. Uh, actually, people on, in both parties feel that. But they're also concerned about the economy. Oh, now, there, there's a couple of things to raise there. And one of them is President Biden continues shaking hands, smiling a lot, making almost comical expressions from time <laughs> to time as he goes through the room, uh, leaning over to kiss someone. He's got a blue tie. He's got a pocket handkerchief. As he goes through the room, um, I just want to note that this concern about democracy has been turned on its head by the other side. Donald Trump talks about uh, democracy being a threat. Well, that is a Donald Trump signature move that whatever he's accused of, he accuses his opponent of. I mean, the best defense is a good offense. You know, you say I'm bad for democracy. No, you're bad for democracy. Remember puppet, puppet? No, yeah. you're the puppet. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, that's that's his modus operandi. At the same time, this is the other thing that's a little bit more substantive, and that is that we've just gone through these Republican primaries, but we've got some chanting on the floor now. Four more, Four more years. years. Four more years. Certainly the Democrats doing this and clapping as they go. As they continue that chant, I want to note in the Republican primaries, Nikki Haley challenged Donald Trump until the other day. And in exit polls, one of the significant divisions, it seemed, between Trump voters and Haley voters was that Haley voters understood that Joe Biden had won the 2020 presidential election, which does, Asma Khalid, imply perhaps that these are people who are concerned about democracy and concerned about 
the normal operations of the Republic. He does. And look, you know, Steve, I have met voters like that. I was down in Arizona uh, talking with a number of, I would call them like more independent minded Republicans, uh, senior citizens, many of whom had deep concerns about the direction Donald Trump had taken the country in. But ultimately, my question is, where do those Nikki Haley voters go? We've seen Biden try to make an appeal to them. Uh, The problem is Biden stitched together a really big tent in 2020. Uh, I don't know that he can stitch that exact really wide tent together again. I mean, it'll be wide, but it won't be as deep. I mean, the problem is that he's facing erosion in some of the key areas. It's not that they're not going to be in the coalition. They're just going to be fewer of them. Young people, people of color. Now, independents up for grabs. There are fewer of them than ever. But the question about the Nikki Haley voters is so interesting because now some of them in some primaries were Democrats. I mean, the open primaries, they were Democrats. They, They aren't really up for grabs. But the question is, how many of Republican Haley voters would be willing to vote for Joe Biden? Even a little slice would make a big difference. Five or 10 percent would make a difference. Yes. That could be more significant even than the votes that Biden is losing over Gaza, perhaps. It could be, depending on the state, sure. Asma, I want to ask a little more about the independent po- voters that you describe. We're watching the elite of Washington here on the screen. Ultimately, they get their power from the people. When you were talking with more independent-minded voters, what are some of the other things you heard that were on their minds? Well, they were really unsatisfied with an election, a potential election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump that we are now likely going to see. It was something that nobody really wanted to see. That was not the ideal matchup. Um, But I will say uh, the economy comes up time and again. And to go back to what Mara was saying, uh, I think people feel frustrated to be told that things are getting better when they feel like costs have not uh, decreased. And ultimately, that is a, a huge problem for folks who are on fixed incomes. And so I think we're going to hear this president, we're going to hear a lot more from this White House about And we're about to hear from the president, we'll hear the applause that he receives as he gets up to the rostrum and ceremonially hands a, a couple of items to Speaker Johnson. Vice President Kamala Harris is in her seat as well and will be behind the president as he speaks. The president giving a few more salutes and waves. <laughs> Tony! Calling out people by name. (laughs) This may last a little while. I will note for the record that people on both sides of the aisle are standing and applauding the president at this moment. If there's going to be a moment when some people are standing and others are sitting on their hands, it is not now. Calling out his wife, the first lady. Speaker trying to gavel for order and not getting Good very evening. far. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. <laughs> Is that Mr. Republican Speaker, say, go home? Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, In January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation. And he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. 
Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. Can they stand up? Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrections stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. One of several moments when we've had Democrats applauding, Republicans sitting down. As I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. 
Remember your oath of office to defend against all threats, foreign and domestic. <laughs> respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest history is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us tonight is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourteen months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Guarantee the right to AVF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos. That has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you did right about that. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? Record losses? Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate? Raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind? 
a mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a th news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <clears throat> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America and all Americans to make every sure everyone has a fair shot and we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. <clears throat> Folks, I inherited economies on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope with historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America, and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up. Inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my pre predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. <laughs> Creating good-paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <clears throat> In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. <clears throat> and, thanks, and thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you strongly voted against it or they're cheering on that money coming in.
I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. Biden referring to Republicans there who have sometimes taken credit for infrastructure improvements they Providing voted against. Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in family farms. Because I invested in family farms led by my sector of agriculture who knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois, home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, a new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same You're listening to the State of the Union Address on NPR News. The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs of the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Here tonight is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn, and Dawn Sims, a third generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line. And today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Interesting little phrase a moment ago when the president spoke of Wall Street, they didn't build America, then added they're not bad guys before going on to criticize him. A subtlety of approach that some on the political left might not have liked so much. Tonight, tonight I want to talk about the future of possibilities that we can build together. A future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. 
Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. One of many applause lines for Democrats. Republicans applauded several times at the beginning, but have had less and less of that. What I proposed and signed, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it. We finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to... But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American in Egypt. Everyone. For years, people have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors money. It's saving taxpayers money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. Will not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. (laughs) Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year. Even for expensive cancer drugs, it costs $10,000, $12,000, $15,000. I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. (laughs) Folks. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get an Air Force One with me and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. <laughs> and bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very big deal. A reference to a more uh, raw statement Biden made once upon a time. (laughs) Over 100 million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. But my predecessor and many in this chamber want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before, and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. To state the obvious, women are more than half our population, but research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. To pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well. And the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit 
that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now pass. Now pass and build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year, I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing, having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the Business Roundtable. They were mad that I, they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as vice president, I met with over eight, I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me to the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides, though. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them. And I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me, providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good-paying job whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle-class families and increase record investments in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. And I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans. I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly four million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, and others in public service. Like Keenan Jones, a public educator in Minnesota, who's here with us tonight. Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college. Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college.
You're listening to the State of the Union speech on NPR News. Such relief is good for the economy because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise. I'll just note, we can expect to be here a while. We now have the prepared text of the speech. We're not quite halfway through, and the president has been ad-libbing in several places this evening. Some of what you're hearing is not in the remarks. couple years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal. To cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations and very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top 1% the very wealthy and the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations and the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay him 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2%. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires of 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. And imagine what that could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave, because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine the future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities 
so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of the aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will — that's the proposal. Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. Look. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations that engage in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. I really mean it. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get, you get charged the same amount, and you got about, I don't know, 10 percent fewer Snickers in it. <laughs> Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. <laughs> Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front so there are no surprises. It matters. It matters. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges help tackle the backload of 2 million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. 
The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is — yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know — I know you know how to read. I believe that given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, the majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win. He viewed it as a, would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner not really. I — A little more heckling here. Lincoln — Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people — people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border, because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the 8,000 dollars. But — but if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and come all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. Right. Folks, I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. Marjorie Taylor Greene is said to be among those heckling the president there, challenging the president. Speaker Mike Johnson has sometimes been shaking his head on camera behind the president as he speaks. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. But that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. <clears throat> We're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on Earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution, to chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere. But we're all Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. Speaker Mike Johnson again shaking his head. He rejected that border bill, as did Donald Trump. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten. They were bloody and left for dead. Our late friend and former colleague, John Lewis, was on that march. We miss him. But joining us tonight, 
Our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, their forces taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here, but if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop, stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, <clears throat> I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage, because every worker has a right to a decent living more than eight, seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. And taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. And pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at, we made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as I've been doing by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law of the land. Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or having it on their record. The person we heard shouting, United States Take Marines, seems to have been a spectator violence. who's now been ejected. I'm ramping up the Federal Enforcement of the Violence Against Women Act that I proudly wrote when I was a senator. So we can finally, finally end the scourge against women in America.
There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message. So everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House, with the Vice President is leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oof. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There is his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. The None president, of this. The president has delivered None many of these of lines directly at the Republican side. I taught side. the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent People, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... <clears throat> We will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a... <coughs> Excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> this war. has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. Families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, and to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring 
a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> And I say this as a lifelong supporter of Israel. My entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. There's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I built a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America is falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America is rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up. Our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I've revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills, but there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? <laughs> pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more and keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <clears throat> That's why the song Support and Help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act, one of the most significant laws ever helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home. 
but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will. Let me close with this. Yay. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. It's the American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born in mid-World War II when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, a career in service. I left the law firm and became a public defender because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president, or our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. <clears throat> In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on ascended elevators for votes sometimes. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. <laughs> Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are. It's how old are our ideas? Yeah. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. Yeah. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities. You need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Yeah. Tonight, you've heard mine. I see a future where defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future will restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I see a future where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. Above all, I see a future for all Americans. I see a country for all Americans. 
and I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. I believe in you, the American people. You're the reason we've never been more optimistic about our future than I am now. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is live special coverage from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. Many people have been listening on radio stations or watching at NPR.org or on YouTube as we cover President Biden's State of the Union address, which he just finished. It was a lengthy address, considerably more than an hour, including a number of improvised passages and jabs back and forths with Republicans in the room, even a heckler who had to be removed at one point. Let's talk about these speeches a little bit. First, review of some of the things the president said. I know I may not look like it, but I've been around a while, the president said, as he began a peroration, a conclusion that was, for the most part, about his age and trying to turn that on its head. He called at the beginning to wake up Congress. He talked about Ukraine. He talked about Gaza. He talked about Roe versus Wade, a sweeping speech. And we're going to discuss it all with NPR's Mara Eliasson and Asma Khalid. Uh, and Asma, let's let's begin with the end. What did you make of the, the president addressing that that elephant in the room about his age. It, it strikes me that this is precisely what he needed to do and what the campaign operation of his reelect believes he needs to do, which is directly tackle this age question. There was a point, Steve, where he said uh, the issue is not how old we are. It's how old our ideas are. And he referred to the issues of uh, the ideas of hate and anger and revenge, uh, presumably referring to his predecessor, Donald Trump, as being old ideas. Um, you know, by and large, Steve, I think this speech was in many ways a pep rally. You heard him try trying to energize the American public that the best days are ahead. But it was also, uh, I think, as expected, a campaign speech. He referred multiple times to his predecessor in calling out, you know, ad- specific things, whether it was around Roe versus Wade, um, the immigration bill that didn't pass in Congress, and singled out Donald Trump. And this is really, I think, the moment in which he needed to do this politically, because it is now really turning into a general election mode, and he needs to present a contrast. Mara Liasson, what struck you as important here? What struck me as important was what he decided to put at the beginning. He started out with Ukraine versus Putin, and he was demanding that Congress stand up, help NATO, and provide military aid to Ukraine. Uh, I thought that was some of his most forceful remarks ever about that. He came pretty close to saying, you're either with Putin or you're with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he went right to abortion. Before we go on to abortion, let's listen to a little bit of what the president had to say this evening about Ukraine, Russia, and Vladimir Putin. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th. Asma, I took notice of the first person singular there. I will not bow down. And it wasn't the only time in this speech that he was using that word. He would look at Republicans and said, I will stop you, for example. Mm -hmm. He was putting himself in the story. Exactly. And and I think that's in part because he was trying to present, uh, you know, Republicans in, con- in Congress with, I think, a clear choice to make. Look, I mean, many of the legislative things he was calling for, I think, are very unlikely to pass. Things like the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and he talked about codifying Roe versus Wade if he was given the votes in Congress. This was about presenting a choice to voters for the 2024 election. And let's go back to one of those choices. You were talking about abortion a moment ago, uh, Mara. That was another extended passage in this speech, even though it is hard to imagine in this Congress anything passing that Biden would want. He put it in terms of 
if you give me a better Congress next time or a more democratic Congress next time. Yeah, his goal was not to pass. He certainly wants to pass legislation codifying Roe, but that wasn't his political goal tonight. This is the most motivating issue for Democrats this year is reproductive rights. It's expanded not just from abortion, but to IVF, which is what parents do to have children, not to terminate pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And he was challenging Republicans, hundreds of whom have said that life begins at conception, that that means that embryos are actually human beings. And uh, he wants a bill uh, preserving the right to IVF, which probably won't pass Congress. But this is something that Democrats feel is a very, very good issue on them. This is a dilemma for Republicans. One of the people who has said right. life begins at conception was in the camera shot this evening, right. the House Speaker, Speaker of Mike the House. Johnson. Yeah. Right. If life begins at conception, embryos are living people and individuals. And destroying them would be murder. I mean, that's just the logical conclusion of the anti-abortion uh, stand. And Republicans know that IVF is very popular, and they're scrambling to try to square the circle here. I want to go on to another bit of legislation that isn't passing. There was some discussion of an immigration bill that looked like it was coming together on a bipartisan basis in the United States Senate, and then former President Trump came out against it, and Republicans abandoned it, and President Biden began speaking directly to the Republican side of the House, the Republican members of Congress about this. Let's listen to a little bit of this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. As McCullough, those who are watching with us saw the president's face during these remarks. Those listening on the radio, maybe it, it looked like he was enjoying himself it quite a few It did look like he enjoyed having these moments of sparring back and forth with uh, some Republicans who were intervening. He did this similarly on an issue around Social Security and the tax bill that Republicans, or the tax bill, I should say, that it seems like former President Donald Trump would like to put forth if he becomes elected again. He liked questioning where they were. Uh, and I will say that, you know, I think the challenge here on immigration is that, you know, the the president is accurate in saying that this was a bill that had many conservative priorities. In fact, it was a bill in which he was repeatedly getting criticized by the left within progressives within his own party who did not agree with the stepped up enforcement. Um, and so, you know, it is a good challenge to pose to Republicans and to, I think, make that contrast clear to many voters. And this is what Democrats are hoping to do in the months ahead. Again, it does not look likely that this bill will pass, but they do realize immigration is a top priority. So what do you do? You try to show that it was Republicans who held up the bill. Let's bring another voice back into the conversation. NPR's Claudia Grisales is at the House of Representatives, was there for the speech, and is observing as President Biden shakes many hands on the House floor. Claudia, what stood out for you and what are you seeing? Well, it's really interesting to see President Biden over the course of several years of his State of the Union addresses to this chamber. The first one was still during the pandemic. It was uh, focused on unity. The second one, we saw more of this back and forth, heckling, if you will, and, and, the, and the president enjoying that dynamic, it seemed, in a repeat of that this year. He came in with a lot more fire when we compare this State of the Union address to his previous years. And this is what I heard from Republican members when I asked them what to expect. They said they expected Biden to come out swinging, and it really appeared that that was the case. And as Asma mentioned, there were moments, the sparring back and forth, such as with Marjorie Taylor Green. This is the Georgia Republican. She was wearing a Make America Great Again red hat uh, during the speech. And that went back and forth for some time. But it appears Biden was fueled by these moments. And Republicans, at the beginning, I saw some standing when he when the president spoke of Ukraine. But as the speech went on, I saw a lot of frustrated looks. I saw more members focusing on their phones. And I even saw about a dozen leaving 
saying during the course of the speech. Hmm. And one member, Don Bacon, he was one of the first members. He's Nebraska Republican. He's facing a tough race this midterm, this this election year. I'm sorry. He said that this was a partisan political stump speech and not a dignified state of the union address. This is a post he put on social media. So it probably captures a lot of sentiments for Republicans in terms of how they feel leaving this chamber today. Uh, it's interesting, though, that based on your reporting, Claudia, Biden, with that speech, knocked Republicans off their game because before the speech, you were telling us that you had heard that Speaker Mike Johnson wanted people to behave with decorum in there. Exactly. And this is something that Johnson really wanted to see happen. But as I spoke with Republican members who heard these remarks behind closed doors yesterday, they while they agreed with that assessment, they were very skeptical that no Republican member would interrupt. And we saw multiple interruptions and heckling from Republicans um, during points in the speech. So no, as, as these Republican members predicted, they would not be able to resist. And that is a frustration tonight, we imagine, for Johnson, who wanted his members, his conference, to illustrate decorum during this speech. Mara Lyason, you surprised? No, it was ever thus for Mike Johnson. I mean, he's had trouble getting his Republican members to cooperate on many, many things, including behaving in the State of the Union address. So that's not a surprise. What I thought was really interesting about the speech was how much of it was economic populism. This is something that has never failed Democrats. Sometimes they're they're tardy to come back to it. But Al Gore, Bill Clinton, this was an economically populist speech, talked about raising the corporate minimum tax, talks about how billionaires pay only 8.2 percent, far less than the vast majority of American taxpayers. Uh, he talked about how he's proposed a minimum tax of 25 percent for billionaires, standing up for seniors, protecting Social Security and Medicare. These are things that matter to voters and they are things that Democrats have usually profited by focusing on. I am fascinated by the president's approach to these things because we had Faz Shakir in our studios, who's an advisor to Bernie Sanders, farther to the left of the Democratic Party the other day. And he was making an argument that Biden has been doing a lot of economic populist things, Absolutely. left things, but does not talk mm. like an economic populist. Well, he did tonight. And he did somewhat tonight. But even as he did that, I noticed he's like Wall Street. They're not bad guys, but they didn't Yeah, but he's America. not going to be Bernie Sanders. No, that's he's why not going to be Bernie Sanders. That's why he beat Bernie Sanders That's because he point. has economic populist agenda without being a socialist firebrand. But I do think, to your point, Mara, there is more economic populism in here, and and more, I would argue, than we've heard from Democrats in years past. I mean, the, the degree to which you hear them talk about specifically cutting fees, going after corporations, I mean, there is a sense that, sure, he's not Bernie Sanders, but I do think Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, they've all sort of moved the party left on some of these issues where what the president, who is a Democrat now, can say is fundamentally different than what a president who was a Democrat in the 90s would say. Yes, but the, these proposals have been uh, standard Democratic proposals over several presidencies. I mean, there's nothing in here that Barack Obama would have disagreed with, or even Bill Clinton. Sure. And uh, he also went back and said, if you threaten Social Security, I will stop mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Democratic standbys. Yeah. I want to note for those listening, thank you, by, for, by the way, for listening or for watching uh, at NPR.org or elsewhere, that we are going to carry the Republican response to this speech in a few minutes. Katie Boyd Britt, United States Senator from Alabama, in her 40s, uh, rising star in the Republican Party, will give the speech in a little while. Uh, meanwhile, we'll hear a little bit more of what the president had to say. And let's talk about a broad theme of this speech. The president talked a lot about restoring or defending freedom. And let's hear a little bit of what he had to say about that. Oh, we will not have it, but he said, there are state laws banning the right to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states as well to get the care they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedoms will you take away next? Mara Eliasson, that's about a specific issue that works for him, abortion. But he's also using it to make broader points. And he's about using freedom. the language, at least the word freedom, which Republicans have kind of owned for a long time. But he's recasting it in a different way. 
um, they used to talk about freedom from big government and re- and regulations, but now he's saying, you know, reproductive freedom, the freedom to to make your own choices for your own family, your own body. That's how he's defining it, and that has uh, been. Uh, when Democrats focus group this and poll it, it really works. I think there's a substantive reason for this as well. This is a different Republican Party where there is not every Republican, but a number of Republicans are taking that Ron DeSantis approach that government needs to be more active in imposing traditional values right. or defending traditional right. values. Big government like Republican it. style. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Asma Khalid, what else stood out for you? You know, far uh, into this speech, the president did touch on an issue of major foreign policy issue uh, that yeah. I think has been really galvanizing uh, parts of his base, and that's the uh, the war in the Middle East. And I think what we heard from the president tonight was perhaps, I think, the strongest and furthest he's gone uh, in acknowledging the humanitarian crisis uh, in Gaza. You heard him talk about uh, a new plan to create a temporary uh, a pier along the Gaza coast to let humanitarian aid in. Uh, this is directly in response to the fact that they have not been able to pressure the Netanyahu government into allowing land ports open. Um, uh, he also talked directly to, to the Israeli leadership and said, don't think that humanitarian aid it should be used as a bargaining chip. I mean, I think over time of covering this White House and covering in, in particular this conflict from uh, the lens of the White House, Steve, there is a growing frustration with dealing with the Netanyahu government. And I think that some of that came through in what we heard from Biden today. But there's also, I think, a reality that this is an issue for a portion of his base and the images. And the, as the death toll climbs, Biden needs to take this issue head on. Biden is paying a price for this politically, isn't he? I think with a portion of his base, he seems to be uh, paying an issue. Uh, I'm sorry, paying a price for it. I, I don't. I do think it's relatively unknown as to how big of a price this may be. You know, you talk to uh, you talk to folks within the campaign. You talk to uh, I think Biden allies, and there's a sense that the reality of this crisis in the Middle East may look really different by October, November. And there's an assumption that when Donald Trump is on the other side. Um, voters will make a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump on this issue. But uh, at this point in time, it has been one of the biggest vulnerabilities we've seen. He's heard from his supporters. We think about the Michigan primary. He heard from his supporters or past supporters. I can't bear to do it. And I can't come back to you unless I see some change. It sounds like the White House is counting on time to bring that change. If there's a ceasefire, which the White House has been negotiating for for weeks, fruitlessly so far, that would change there things. There is. I mean, you've also though seen. I think the challenge for Biden though is fundamentally. Uh, you know, he's even gotten pushback from. If you look at, you know, some uh, I would say very, rather high-profile senators like Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, who have come out and said, um, you know, you, you need to do more in terms of pressuring the Israeli government. And I think the challenge for Biden is that even in doing a you know a peer access to let aid in via uh, via the sea i mean that's something that that countries don't do with allies usually you would pressure your ally uh, israel to allow the land route to open and you heard a little bit of that today i think there is a recognition though from this white house that they need to take this issue head on uh, i think both uh, from a national security standpoint but also from a domestic political standpoint mar elias and i want to note a little bit of the style of this speech the president stumbled over some prepared lines and at the same time was ad-libbing from time to time. There were entire passages of this speech, we noted, that were not in the speech that seemed to have occurred to him in the moment. Yeah, he improvised. He was spontaneous. He came in shouting, which is a way that people show that they're strong and vigorous. I mean, you know, he didn't, he talked softly at times, but also I think he worked hard to address the age issue. Of course, he talked about it a lot at the end, at the very end. And um, I think that, yes, he had a lot of stumbles, and that's kind of standard for for President Biden. But uh, his voice was strong, and uh, he came across as a fighter. He talked about all the things he would do. He would stop this from happening, or he would, you know, do this for the middle class. I'm just waiting to see what the results of this will be and whether this changes people's impressions yeah, of him. I'm, we I'm just with, don't know. I'm with Mara on yeah. that. I mean, I, I, I do think that, you know, there are moments during this speech where he stumbled over words, misspoke, um, that reinforce some of the voters' concerns about his age. I think for those of us who listen to him speak regularly, maybe we we hear these things routinely, but I don't know how it translates now, to voters. Now, listeners do not have prepared remarks. They're that not going to be able to compare what was written but and what he said. 
said, it's when he stumbled, they'll be able to notice that. But they won't notice when he didn't say what was on the page. I do wonder, though, about, you know, the cadence, the, the, um, the stumbles, as you say. I wonder how that translates. And I just don't know that we will have a sense of that. And look, this is a very high profile moment for the president, but it's not the only high profile moment. Likely a lot of folks will pay attention to that convention speech this summer. And there are moments in which he is needing and expected uh, to perform without any mistakes. I want to note that uh, we're watching the video feed. The president, it's been quite some time since the speech ended, is still on the House floor chatting now with the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other members of the, or the, the members of the, 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 the Joint Chiefs. And uh, he's continuing to talk there. And we're going to go to Claudia Grisales, who is still at the Capitol and has one more observation. Claudia, what's on your mind? Right. I, I thought it was very striking in the president's speech tonight how much time he spent speaking about the border. As we know, there was a bipartisan border bill uh, put together by a group of senators uh, over several months' time. It appeared Republicans would uh, push forward with that in exchange for aid for Ukraine, Israel, and other allies. However, that imploded as Republicans turned on that, uh, including former President Trump. Many said they were influenced by his direction to not go in the direction of this legislation. And so it's interesting to see the president tonight spend so much time talking about the border, talking about the concerns with asylum, but also talking about the demonization of immigrants and that he would not go there. And, And this This is a theme I heard about when I traveled in the Texas border region recently. I spoke to Democratic members in the region. And for example, we got to stop you there because we now have the Republican response from Senator Katie Boyd Britt. And mom of two school aged kids. My daughter Bennett and my son Ridgeway are why I ran for the Senate. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear though, President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off, our communities are less safe, and our country is less secure. I just wish he understood what real families are facing around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together, and it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. And many nights, to be honest, it's where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation. Because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away, and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living their American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise Alabama, to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across just one generation, in just one lifetime, it's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. 
President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis, he invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room, and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. From fentanyl poisonings to horrific murders, there are empty chairs tonight at kitchen tables just like this one because of President Biden's senseless border policies. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22-year-old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight, President Biden finally said her name. But he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. Innocent Americans are dying, and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis, and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through the roof. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking families are struggling to make ends meet today and with soaring mortgage rates and sky high childcare costs. They're also struggling to how to plan for tomorrow. The American people are scraping by while President Biden proudly proclaims that Bidenomics is working. Goodness, y'all, bless his heart, we know better. I'll never forget stopping at a gas station in Chilton County one evening. The gentleman working the counter told me that after retiring, he had to pick up a job in his 70s so that he didn't have to choose between going hungry or going without his medication. He said, I, I did everything right. I did everything I was told to do. I worked hard, I saved, I was responsible. He's not alone. 
I hear similar concerns from fellow parents, whether I am walking with my friends or whether I'm at my kids' games. But let's be honest, it's been a minute since Joe Biden pumped gas, uh, ran a carpool, or even pushed a grocery cart. Meanwhile, the rest of us see our dollar and we know it doesn't go as far. We see it every day. And despite what he tells you, our communities are not safer. For years, the left has coddled criminals and defunded the police, all while letting repeat offenders walk free. The result is tragic, but foreseeable. From our small towns to America's most iconic city streets, life is getting more and more dangerous. And unfortunately, President Biden's weakness isn't just hurting families here at home. He is making us a punchline on the world stage. Look, where I'm from, your word is your bond. But for three years, the president has demonstrated that America's word doesn't mean what it used to. From abandoning our allies in his disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan to desperately pushing another dangerous deal with Iran. President Biden has failed. We've become a nation in retreat. And the enemies of freedom, they see an opportunity. Putin's brutal aggression in Europe has put our allies on the brink. Iran's terrorist proxies have slaughtered Israeli, Jews, and American citizens. They've targeted commercial shipping, and they've attacked our troops nearly 200 times since October, killing three U.S. soldiers and two Navy SEALs. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, it conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Just ask yourself, are you better off now than you were three years ago? There's no doubt we're at a crossroads and it doesn't have to be this way. We all feel it. But here's the good news. We, the people, are still in the driver's seat. We get to decide whether our future will grow brighter or whether we'll settle for an America in decline. Well, I know which choice our children deserve, and I know the choice the Republican Party is fighting for. We are the party of hardworking parents and families, and we want to give you and your children the opportunities to thrive. And 
We want families to grow. It's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We want to help loving moms and dads bring precious life into this world. Wesley and I believe there is no greater blessing in life than our children. And that's why tonight I want to make a direct appeal to the parents out there and in particular to my fellow moms, many of whom I know will be up tossing and turning at 2 a.m., wondering how you're going to be in three places at once and then somehow still get dinner on the table. First of all, we see you, we hear you, and we stand with you. I know you're frustrated. I know you're probably disgusted by most of what you see going on in Washington, and I'll be really honest with you, you're not wrong for feeling that way. Look, I get it. The task in front of us isn't an easy one, but I can promise you one thing. It is worth it. So I am asking you for the sake of your kids and your grandkids, get into the arena. Every generation has been called to do hard things. American greatness rests in the fact that we always answer that call. It's who we are. Never forget, we are steeped in the blood of patriots who overthrew the most powerful empire in the world. We walk in the footsteps of pioneers who tamed the wild. We now carry forward the same flame of freedom as the liberators of an oppressed Europe. We continue to draw courage from those who bent the moral arc of the universe. And when we gaze upon the heavens, never forget that our DNA contains the same ingenuity that put man on the moon. America has been tested before, and every single time we've emerged unbowed and unbroken. Our history has been written with the grit of men and women who got knocked down. But we know their stories because they did not stay down. We are here because they stood back up. So now it's our turn, our moment to stand up and prove ourselves worthy of protecting the American dream. Together, we can reawaken the heroic spirit of a great nation. Because America, we don't just have a rendezvous with destiny. We take destiny's hand and we lead it. Our future starts around kitchen tables just like this, with moms and dads just like you. And you are why I believe with every fiber of my being that despite the current state of our union, our best days are still ahead. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless these United States of America. This is live special coverage from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. We'll spend a few minutes analyzing what we've just heard. President Biden earlier this evening delivered his State of the Union speech. We just heard Senator Katie Boyd Britt deliver the Republican response from her kitchen. And Mara Liason, there were a lot of, of, of standard Republican themes in there, but she threw in something toward the end was, which was notable. She said, we support IVF. Yes, and we'll see how the Republicans decide to do that. Alabama did pass a law after its state Supreme Court decided to say that human embryos were humans and deserved all the rights of any other child. And um, that caused a huge 
outcry. The Alabama state legislature passed a bill that purports to protect families and doctors who engage in the process of IVF, where some embryos may be destroyed. That's a very common part of this procedure, and that's what the state Supreme Court was trying to um, make illegal, criminalize. As as for Holland, we were talking earlier about the way that President Biden, in his speech, attempted to embrace his age and turn it into an advantage, effectively saying, I may look old to you, but I have new ideas. And my opponent, who is also old, has old ideas. Uh, Senator uh, Katie Boyd Britt went directly at the president on this question, describing him, according to my notes, as dithering and diminished, That's among right. several I other things. I wrote those exact same adjectives down as well because it caught my ear, Steve. I mean, I think, look, symbolically, you have a woman who is 40 years old, uh, by all accounts, a millennial. Uh, she is of a very different generation, made a point that President Biden has actually been in political office for longer than she has been alive. Uh, This was a generational shift. I mean, I I think that it was a clear message that the Republicans were trying to send about Biden's age by selecting her to give the Republican response. But what I was struck by, Steve, is so much of the messaging that she was delivering does not speak to where a vast majority of voters who are of her age are. She is a millennial. You look at the under 18 population. It is is dramatically shifted. She spoke so many times about children. Uh, children of America today are far more diverse than, you know, the children of, of older generations. And so I was struck by how she spoke um, indirectly. So she never said anything explicitly about race and immigration on the border. But Steve, you can read between the lines. There was a racial undertone of some of this about uh, or an incident of rape and then an incident of killing and of crime and illegals coming across the border. That to me was striking, Steve, because it is not where so many voters of her age group are when you look at that policy issue. I was interested in a particular phrasing, and we think about this a lot in broadcasting. Who are you talking to? And if you talk in the second person, you, who are you really talking to? At the end, she said, Moms and dads, Mm -hmm. just like you. Suburban women, independence, the people that Republicans need to get. She gave a very Donald Trump, American carnage type speech aimed at the voters that he still doesn't really have. It wasn't just a, even though there was a lot of red meat in it, and it was really an intense speech that was very Trumpian and it's just depictions over and over again about crime committed by illegal Mm -hmm. aliens, undocumented Uh, immigrants, we know that the truth is that undocumented immigrants commit much, many fewer crimes than uh, legal citizens. And in communities that have high numbers of undocumented immigrants, crime rates are actually lower. But um, But you can find the one case which has happened. Sure. sure. And they've done that. And um, but she was a good messenger for the Republican Party. She's young. She's a mom, mm-hmm. and that's who I think the audience was. Suburban oh. women who are going to be in some ways up for grabs. That's why she talked about IVF, and th- this is something that is a deficit And for she Trump. spoke about the economy at length and costs, and that is a real issue, Steve. It is an issue that I began to cover, I would say, about two years ago. You started hearing it from voters. It is an issue that has not died down, and uh, she spoke to the fact that she feels like President Biden is out of touch, hasn't pumped gas or gone to the grocery store himself, and I would say that is a perception that some voters have. I want to go one more Neither time. Neither has Donald Trump of the golden escalator. One, one might note, <laughs> uh, there might be quite a few people who are at the uh, State of the Union speech yeah. this evening who haven't done those things <laughs> in a little while. But I want to go back to the U.S. Capitol one more time because our colleague Claudia Grisales has been following the progress of President Biden after the State of the Union speech. Uh, he seems, Claudia, did, what, did he shut out the lights there? What, what happened with the president? <laughs> He had very many (laughs) extended conversations with several members of Congress, cabinet members. They were starting to turn out the lights on him. Yes, he has overstayed his welcome, if you will. And so some members of the press were able to linger back. Some of us were able to escape to our booths here on Capitol Hill to be able to to continue our broadcast. But he was really enjoying all of those conversations. It was clear after he had wrapped up his speech. Well, Claudia, thanks very much for your observations this evening. I'm glad we had you there tonight. 
Thank you. Uh, and I want to get a final word or two, if I can, from Asma and from Mara Eliasson. Asma, let's talk about the road ahead. The president and the vice president are going out. This is not officially a campaign speech, but mm-hmm. they're going to go out and do the campaign versions of these speeches? They are. The president, I believe, is going to be in Pennsylvania tomorrow. You'll see the VP out on the West Coast, Arizona, uh, Nevada shortly after that. I mean, these are competitive states. You look at the map that Democrats and Republicans need. There's only really about six states at play. So they will be taking uh, this message about curbing costs, uh, freedom and democracy on the road. And you can bet these are themes we're going to continue to hear. Mara Eliasson, let's just talk about the political campaign that is the backdrop for this official duty that the president had. Um, How close is it? How would you how would you assess the race at this moment? At this moment? Biden is trailing. At this moment, he has been behind or even with Donald Trump in almost every poll. I think there are very, very few that show him ahead. And if so, they're within the margin of error. So he starts out on his back foot. Um, he ha- The battleground states, Osmond's right, there's only about six of them, and they do tilt a little more Republican uh, than the country at large. He has to win the popular vote by many points, five, four to six points, in order to win in the Electoral College. So that's a disadvantage that any Democratic candidate would have. So I would say he starts this cycle, uh, and now the general election has begun in earnest. You could say this was the the curtain raiser, with a lot of deficits. And uh, the campaign has an idea of how to make up some of them, but that's what he's going to do. Okay. NPR's Mara Eliasson, NPR's Esma Holland, thanks very much for joining us on this evening. It's been a pleasure talking with you both. And that's going to be our coverage of the 2024 State of the Union. I do want to thank Mara, Asma, and also Claudia for their work. And thanks to you for watching or listening along with us tonight. And thanks to our team behind the scenes. You can hear more analysis on NPR's Morning Edition. And for the latest at any time, go to NPR.org. I'm Steve Inskeep. Have a nice evening.